everybody and welcome to Darg, the podcast that brings you information and education on endometriosis and adenomyosis. My name is Kathleen King and I'm joined by somebody who is not only an amazing inspiration to me, somebody I consider a friend and an absolute mentor and idol and all of the positive things you can think of, Helena Tuberty. Helena, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Kathleen. What an incredibly delightful introduction. I'm, I'm blushing here. Um, mostly totally inaccurate, but you are very kind and it really is an honor to be here. It's a subject very, very dear to my heart. Thank you. And Helena, we know you from the media. We know you from TV. We've seen lots of articles and of course you have a really, really good social media channel as well too. And for anybody who doesn't know you, you are a fertility coach, an IVF coach. You also deal with people who have um, miscarriages and loss. And can you tell me a little bit more about your background and the work that you currently do as well? So I come from an NHS midwifery background, which was the apprenticeship system, which was working in community and hospital, home births, very much called the midwife. And I guess in my career, seeing colleagues, seeing women, and I never like the word patient because, you know, somebody who's having a baby is a healthy person, but seeing people who had, you know, gone through labor and it might have been quite complicated with extraordinarily high pain thresholds and realizing that people with endometriosis were astonishing people to deliver their pain thresholds way off the Richter scale. Then coming into um, my own colleagues having issues conceiving and being the go-to person because I grew up in a veterinary and a pharmaceutical house and my all my grandparents were doctors, so you know the kind of the conversations were lurid over dinners, and um, you know really I heard about endometriosis when I was a child, and I was discouraged from ever doing cartwheels, uh, not that I could ever have done one, <laughs> uh, but you know that sense of retrograde uh, menstruation was something I knew about, and that obviously was the holy grail. So fast forward to, I mean myself, I was very glad to reach menopause because I had extraordinarily heavy periods and never pain. I was very, very lucky. Uh, but my own daughter, um, very sadly, we identified that she might have issues. So of course, straight to the GP put on the pill, a few years on the pill. By the time she hit 20, it was kind of like, you know, something she obviously needs a little bit more. Happily, very quickly on the pathway to having excision surgery, because I was lucky enough to know Kathleen King at this stage who has given me so much education on this. Thank you very, very much. Um, I always feel that you are now, for my two gorgeous granddaughters, that you are definitely godmother along the way. Um, so Suzanne has spoken about this. Um, you know, she has been a very young mother and she has her two beautiful children. She also has adenomyosis. And, you know, the sense of living with this and seeing how she manages, how well she does, how debilitating it can be, and what little support there is. Um, so I really value the work you do so very much. And the fact that it, you know, you are a scientist. Everything is accurate research based. It's, uh, you know, very um, accessible and very actionable and as cost free as possible. So um, I'm very proud of the work you do on, you know, our behalf, shall I say, and at European level that in your own time and as is, you know, working through a very serious job and you do shift work, which is astonishing. And the fact that, you know, in your own time, traveling up and down and staying over and managing through your own condition and your own symptoms is extraordinary. So I've met very, very many people through you in my work as a fertility coach. It means that I am giving people advice information, support, because um, I'm totally independent. I'm a thorn in every clinic's side and a bit of a patient advocate in my own way, but point people in the right direction. If they're having fertility issues, you know, joining the dots and making sure that they're getting the best possible match for the care that will be most helpful for them. You know, even how to engage the conversations to have, the questions to ask, rather than going down blind alleys or going for the silver bullet. And then, of course, you know, that preparation for IVF and then, you know, should cycles fail, which most of the time they do, three quarters of the time they actually do fail. 
And then it is keeping people motivated. And the very, very sad loss of a pregnancy, a miscarriage, as it's, it's such a misnomer, um, and people who have recurrent pregnancy loss. So that support, that care, this really comes under the umbrella of fertility trauma. So I use EMDR and I use hypnotherapy because I like brief therapy. I like to get to the point, empower people, give them the tools and the techniques, and then that they may keep on their journey or make very difficult decisions and maybe draw a line under trying to conceive or going for next steps. So that's, I guess, what I'm all about. That's such an important role. And certainly for those of us, you know, living with endometriosis and adenomyosis, um, fertility and infertility is such a huge thing. And often in the people I've dealt with over the, the last 25 odd years is the first thing they'll come to you with is like, oh, I won't be able to conceive. The doctor told me that I won't be able to have a child or I need to have a child now. And I'm only 16. What do I do? And it's always there. So you, you've got that initial trauma of, you know, you learn your diagnosis. Uh, we know that, you know, up to 70% of people with endometriosis will conceive. But then that's no good to you if you're in that 30% or if you're in that 30% that might need assisted reproduction. So statistics are good, but they're very cold. And this is where the sort of lived experience and the reality comes in and dealing with people on an individual basis. And that's one of the things I really like about how, you know, you deal, you know, with your clients and you deal with people, you take them on a one-to-one -one basis you go through their individual journey as well too with them. And you look at all the factors around that. Um, that's something that's very unusual in endometriosis and adenomyosis care, that wrap around and that sort of joined up thinking as well, isn't it? Yeah. So if you have um, somebody come to you, like, you know, where where do we start? So if you have something to present to you and say, look, you know, we're in this sort of fertility journey now, where do we go? Where do we start? What's where? What's the first step from your side? I guess the first step is mindset because, you know, the whole thing is really traumatic. Even if you're waiting one or two months to conceive, it can seem like forever because you're working in two week blocks. You know, it's uh, up to ovulation for a time window and then it's waiting for a period or not. And over time, the effect is as traumatic as a diagnosis of HIV or cancer. And, you know, rather than getting easier, it gets harder. You're seeming to diverge from family and friends who might have, you know, partnered up or got married around the same time. They're having a first child, a second child. People are doing the head tilt. What about you? How long have you been together? All of that. So you're feeling that, particularly as a woman. And it is very, 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 very difficult because, you know, sex becomes a chore of, you know, a tick box exercise. I post it on the fridge. We're on. So relationships really take a huge battering and over time and down the line. So I take a very, very, uh, you know, long distance look and the idea of project managing. It's like, OK, we're here. We're trying to conceive. I have this condition, so I'm going to need some extra help. And it's good that I know it. So it is those kind of positives, not the kind of toxic cheerleading positivity, but the sense of, I actually know this because there are other people who will be further along. They might have two failed IVFs, which cost time and heartache and money. And they might only retrospectively get tested. And it's like, oh, whoops. Oh, dear. Look, you have endo. Or they might have tests and it's like, we can't find endo. But some other more experienced eye might pick it up another year down the line, as you well know. It depends on the practitioner. So I guess working with the information you have to get the right care at the right time, you know, targeted and actionable is very important and to work with the variables that you can work with. So, you know, at the risk of sounding so incredibly cliche, the idea that the lifestyle stuff you can control. So whether it is, you know, with the uh, because endo is a complex whole body condition and disease syndrome that, you know, you're working to keep your general health as optimized as possible and all the usual things, sleep, fresh air, light, movement, dance, fun, connection, good sex, 
you know, all of the really basics without the sense, you know, the fertility police, you're not allowed this and you can't have that. Why are you doing this? Just do this. There's no, there's no, as everybody wants me at this time of the year, like, what is, you know, what should I be doing? What is the magic menu? What is the prescription? And it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, with So really making sure that you know what suits you best, what you feel good with, whether you have food intolerances and not going too wild, unless you kind of have them diagnosed. Uh, people are trying to get very restrictive very quickly. And it's like, you know, am I, do I really need to be doing this? Is it helping? And the other thing is enough sleep and enough rest and enough pacing. Women need more sleep anyway than men do. And the idea of resting, you know, we're in the Northern Hemisphere, we're an island in the middle of the Atlantic. We have a winter time that is meant, we're meant to be fairly quiescent. We're living off Californian model of, you know, I'll do a bit of rollerblading at half five, I'll do a yoga at six, and I'll, you know, get my emails done before I go to work at seven, and I'll do 15 minute segments during a day. It's very exhausting. Anyway, with endo, it's kind of about pacing and minding and literally, you know, that word husbanding strength, planning and being flexible that plans can change if there's a flare or something's happening and having other people understand that. But in the middle of all of this, Kathleen, one thing is women shoulder burdens. I'll do it. Let me do it. I'll, I'll know if, you know, who need, do we need new shoes? Do we need a new roof? Will we go to that wedding? You know, can we have a holiday? Can we get the styra in? You know, women do the mental load. What are we having for dinner and doing the shopping? And ever so sweetly, they are sometimes inclined to let men off with a lot or sideline men if I'm being charitable occasionally. So having your partner in really good health because you actually need an egg and a sperm Okay, you need patent tubes, all of that. But if you have, and I have seen this, if you have someone, and often it'll happen, say, in a guy who's a good few years younger or a holiday romance or an affair, that someone will get pregnant out of the blue when they mightn't have with a previous partner who was same age or older, or, you know, the parameters weren't as good. So it really pays to mind your man not in the full Tommy Wynette sense, but, you know, that you are not letting him off the hook, that, you know, he's sleeping, he's moving, he's not doing too much sitting, too much eating, he is not doing too much drinking. It's very Goldilocks. It's very vague. But I like to think of it as preparing for pregnancy, preparing for parenthood. And it's like, well, do you want to be able to run up and down the sidelines and share, do you want to be kind of, oh, no, we're not going here. Uh, do you want to be able to take your kids on hikes? So that kind of broader view and for people going into fertility treatment to realize that, you know, IVF is not a silver bullet. You need a healthy egg. You need healthy sperm. You need a healthy womb. You need a healthy heart to pump everything around. You need good lungs that are used to breathing. So, you know, it, it the same preparation is important for IVF. You can't just hand over and it's like, oh, well, you know, they'll do it all. Um, you know, that is a possibility. It's it's another string to the bow. And I guess at all levels, the mindset and the emotional toll is huge when you have this diagnosis hanging over you or when you, you know, de novo get a diagnosis. The loss and the grief is extraordinary. You know, your femininity. The one thing I'm on this planet to do is reproduce. Oh, everybody around me is doing it. Everybody is expecting, I want to give my partner a child. I want to give my folks grandchildren. I want to be sharing the same experience as my friends and, and, and my siblings. Um, so there's a, so much loss associated with it. And people with endo are used to being so strong and so stoic in the absolute sense of the word. And you see, I've got Socrates back here behind me. Um, the sense that, uh, you know, they sometimes minimize the emotional impact and that can be a bit of a, a sort of a, a negative loop um, and having really good friends, having a fantastic support system, having somebody who knows and understands or having somebody outside that loop to share and discuss and offload onto. 
can be very, very useful. You know, finding what works for you. I mean, I know it's, it's nauseating when you say find your tribe, but, you know, endo can be so unbelievably isolating and it can make people, as I've heard, feel older than they are. It's like I'm going into what is menopause, perimenopause, and everybody around me is kind of going, God, will we have another child? Do we have to get a new car now? You know, the kind of, and that's fine. That's that's their bag at that time. But it can make you feel so old compared to your peers. It, it's it's a huge weight. It is, and it's a very interesting way of looking at it because often when you start your symptoms very early for people who've started their symptoms very early, maybe at their first period, they've had to grow up quicker than they expected. Um, they've had to take on extra responsibilities of all that medical admin that goes with that. They have all the appointments to attend. They have the medication to upkeep. They may have to take a pill every day to help control some of the symptoms. And you're right, you do. You become an adult maybe a lot quicker than what you think. You have to make decisions a lot quicker than what you think. And that grief, I think, of losing your own childhood and then to be faced maybe again with that big decision, you know, where do you go from here? You know, is there another sort of chance of reliving this part of your life? Like, you know, that sort of ability to have your own children. It just becomes so complicated, doesn't it? And, you know, from what you're saying there as well to like the, the find your tribe cliche again, like, but it's give me a better word for it, but um, we can't do this alone. And I, like, I'm the first person to put my hand up and say, I will bulldoze through things. And, you know, I'm the worst for, for pacing. But you learn and learn from our mistakes. The people who've come before you learn from us because the more people you involve who are, you know, key people, people who are there to support you, to build you up, the people who will fill the hot water bottle, the people who will make the tea, the people who will go on that health eating plan with you as well. They'll take that wee walk at lunchtime. You know, they will do those things to help, you know, not just build you up, you know, to help reduce your pain, help improve your fertility chances. But as you say, there's life after pregnancy as well. And sometimes we become so focused on the actual conception that we forget that there's a pregnancy delivery and then a child after that. And is this something that you've seen with people as well, too, that maybe we get very narrow focused? The focus, as I always say, the horizon is in about here. Positive pregnancy test and the mind really cannot go any further. And that's um, a hallmark of trauma. So I like to begin to expand that, um, you know, navigating pregnancy for someone who has endo can actually be really, really nice because it's a whole different physiology going on. So it's being able to savor that without worrying and reducing the anxiety. The whole Instagram thing has really made people unbelievably nervous about the first three months of pregnancy, um, hyper vigilant. And that's, you know, it's good to know, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's too much. It's a, a huge burden on women. Instead of realizing, as I say to people, that pregnancy actually is quite boring. You know, you're fine. You you know, you're, you're chuntering along and it's kind of like it, it takes a good 10 months. It's an awfully long time. And, you know, these apps, your baby's the size of a quarter grain of rice. Your baby's the size of a half grain of rice. And it's kind of like, but there's nothing to see. I can't get into maternity clothes. And it's like, hurry up. Because obviously... The second you're pregnant, you're having a baby. And that is, you know, the the sense of, and you're dying to meet this baby, of course. And to be able to settle into pregnancy, explore it like an investigative journalist. I'm feeling ground. I'm not feeling much. Um, then, you know, announcing, you know, going through the scans and then choosing who you tell, when you tell. It's your news to tell. And, uh, you know, the joy of sharing that. And you know, the second trimester, third trimester, getting really pissed off by the end of it. It's like, I'll be glad when this or I can't see my toes. I can't turn over in bed. I'm peeing every two minutes. And it's like, and then the really important thing is assembling those people, assembling the bloody village, uh, because mothers need minding immediately afterwards to A, recover from pregnancy, B, recover from birth, C, get used to this, 25 hour shift of hour and a half beads. Um, and, you know, the bargaining that happens, it's a little bit like, you know, Kubler Ross and the five stages of grief. There's a bargaining, a sort of a superstitious thinking that we can do. And it's if I get pregnant, if I have a child, I'm going to be the best mother 
ever. And nobody's ever going to mother the way I've mothered, not going to mother with the way my mother mothered. And that's fair enough. But there can be a reluctance to let go and let dad hold or change because he's a bit clunky changing your child. Oh, I'll do it. Or let anybody else. In fact, the more people that of close family type of or friends that your child is with, the more socialized they are. And, you know, it's actually good for them. It's good for a mother, like in the Philippines. Now, obviously, movement is important. We don't want DVDs. But, um, you know, being absolutely minded and fed and massaged and allowed to sleep. And if you're not actually breastfeeding, anybody can feed a baby, anybody with a set of arms and a baby would be really happy. Other people are getting the oxytocin and the bonding. And to have people to clean your house. I had a, a lovely happening my my first daughter. My sister-in-law was heading off to Australia and she was saving money. So I did a deal with her. Instead of the, you know, flowers, beautiful flowers, lovely bouquets of flowers rotting in a vase. I said, and I've never liked lilies anyway, because I was a nurse in a hospital, you know, lilies. And um, she took my sheets, my washing. And she, I think she did it for about, ah, she did it for two months. To this day, I've never forgotten that. It was one of the best presents I ever had. Clean sheets. And I didn't have to think about them. And I had, you know, obviously, you know, times were different. Men just did not know. They had no chip inserted to operate a washing machine or actually do cooking. It just did not happen in those days. But the idea of having people around you to mind you to matrescence is becoming a mother, getting used to the idea. It's a massive psychological shift. And then there's the thing. Are you breastfeeding? Are your periods going to be coming back if you're bottle feeding? How are you going to manage with a child? and broken sleep, fractured sleep. So I like to project people ahead and it's like, okay, it's, you know, after any kind of a delivery, you actually feel as if you've been in a road traffic accident. You really do. You're actually bruised and battered. It's unusual if you're not. It's fabulous if you're not. But this is what it's like. You know, you're on two pads bleeding. You're on your black knickers, paper knickers, and you're smiling for the camera because, of course, you're very happy. And, you know, it's kind of the things people don't tell you. The first poo, you know, oh, it's, it's really scary. And so once you know you're not the only one, it's not unusual, it shifts and changes, you can do this and this is what you do. So that kind of practical empowerment would always, you know, they like, what is it that they say? Put on your own oxygen mask before you put on anybody else's and you're staggering around the, staggering around the aisles causing grief for everyone else. So a mother needs to be looked after fully, completely, comprehensively. And alas and a lack, you know, there are so few people, people are very isolated from family and friends. You've got to find some way of doing that. You can pay in with a doula. You can do a deal with friends. You will find that there's, you know, an empty nester, some woman in her 50s who is kind of a bit lonely. And it's like, you know, do a deal. So I love the idea of including other people in a community, even if you have to kind of shoehorn it. People are very helpful if they're told what is needed. So the living well beyond, because the risk with something like endo and a delay to pregnancy is postnatal anxiety, postnatal depression. And that to me is the cruelest double whammy ever. So I really work to obviate that from an early stage. So it's a bit like mental rehearsals. So people can actually envisage, okay, so what's it going to be like at work being pregnant and permission to take time off if somebody's not feeling, as I say, there's a lovely expression in England. It covers everything from a totally severed leg to a mild touch of sinusitis. It's called feeling poorly. And if somebody tells you they're feeling poorly, I remember it's like, what do you mean? Like, I'm just feeling well. It means that, and especially when someone is pregnant, that they're just feeling odd and peculiar, not quite dizzy or not quite anything, but just not themselves. And it's like, you need to actually spend that morning in bed. You need to text in. You've never done this. And particularly people like teachers, it's like they never do that. And it's like, you have to do this. You have somebody aboard. This is not you. You're just the incubator. And it's like, you know, tough. You never need to do this in your life till the next pregnancy, but it's a short time in your career. So women to mind themselves, uh, because there's nobody else minding women nowadays. There really isn't. 
The public health nurse comes in day three or four. Hello, how's the baby? You're okay, good luck. There's nobody on site who's teaching you how to be a mother or teaching you how to do pregnancy. So there's a lot of good information, but the actual practicalities of care are often missing. So I feel that's where I sort of do education, if you will, and permission that you don't have to be extra brave just because you've had a weight or you don't have to prove yourself or you're not doing this jinxing, not jinxing deal of superstitious thinking. And it's so important, that period of rest. And I think from coming from, uh, uh, you know, I suppose a, a traditional Irish healthcare background myself, like, you know, that sort of way and where we've medicalized um, fertility and childbirth and delivery. And then I studied Chinese medicine and I realized, whoa, we're missing a huge part of it here. And that period of rest and you know, sort of re-nourishing of a person and like a woman who's just delivered is so, so important. And equally, like that time during the pregnancy as well, like for some people with adenomyosis and endometriosis, they will have, you know, um, maybe an improvement in their symptoms. It could be one of the times when they're feeling the best. Equally, I've known people who've stood in the kitchen with the bread lights in their hand ready to take the baby out in six months because the pain has been horrendous. So you've got one side or the other, but it's, planning for that and it's knowing all the options and the outcomes and I think this is where me and you are sort of very similar thinking that when you have all the information you can make those informed choices can't you and I think you know visualizing something that you know may happen or may not happen but acknowledging it and then letting it go rather than clinging to it I think is very important and I know we've chatted before sort of like about like maybe like a a, positive intention or positive visualization, you know, as opposed to what we're seeing on social media, which can be quite toxic at the minute. Um, How would you use the tools that you have? So say like true hypnosis or true some of the other tools that you use in coaching, how can you get us to a point where we can, you know, safely allow ourselves to visualize something and, but at the same time, prepare ourselves for any of those outcomes? Absolutely. Um, I, I call it hoping for the best preparing for the worst in a way and I really like to think of it as you know at this moment you know if somebody is involved in some type of medical fertility care or you know heading for IVF or you know going to another jurisdiction to organize surrogacy if it is within their religious beliefs or whatever that um, you know you do not need to consider all of the absolute negative possibilities at that moment. You can be aware of them, but it's the fear. What if it doesn't work? It's like, well, okay, at this moment, I know I will deal with that should it happen. I know it's, you know, there is a possibility, but I'm actually putting my energy into doing what I can, being what I can, and collaborating with, as you said earlier there, um, which is lovely, Kathleen, you know, the sense of the team, you know, who is, am I... um, you know, bringing in the other team members. Am I actually keeping myself, you know, exercised, fresh air? Am I having a bit of fun and a bit of laugh with people who know nothing about what's going on? People who treat me as normal. Am I working on maybe getting a little bit of promotion that gives me a little bit of ease? Am I living as well as I can? Am I having a really good shiatsu massage? You know, a deep tissue massage. Am I doing what makes me feel good? Am I watching interesting movies or some wonderful shite on Netflix. Am I living well and, you know, not restricting? Because I guess we get really, you know, right down into um, very, very sort of a miserable track. But as you said earlier, the pathologizing of it all. In itself, pregnancy is not a pathology. It's a normal physiology. In fact, it's the final development of breast tissue. Breasts aren't fully developed because, you know, the actual lactation aspect of things And to, I guess, you know, gather the, I like to allow people to have their hopes and their plans in place and that they are bringing everything they possibly can bring to bear upon it. They are including their other half or if they're using donor gametes or whatever way, you know, if they're same sex or solo parents, whatever way they're going to parent, that they can have some idea of how it works in their life. Who's going to be, you know, 
when you when you put your child into crash, you're actually paying money. You're buying disease, and crash is closed at the drop of a hat, and they still charge it. Who's going to barrel off at eleven o'clock of a morning in the middle of a meeting to collect said child? Who have you got in place? Is it always mum? Well, kind of most often it is still. Um, but how this kind of fits in and the sense of, you know, being able to envisage this. And most often, Kathleen, people will tell me, I can't imagine myself being pregnant. I just can't see it. I'm going to the clinic. I'm doing this and I've had three. I just actually can't see it. And it's that permission to say, well, right now, it is a normal and good thing to allow yourself to, you know, am I going to be, you know, going up sizes in leggings? Am I going to be able to get away with it? Do I have to, you know, all of this kind of very, very simple stuff like that. And the sense of managing, you know, the pressure of actually having meds, taking meds, the emotional effects of those are huge. And to realize that help can be needed you know, brief interventions. It's not that you're in therapy like an American three times a week for the next 20 years, anything like that. That's not healthy. Um, but to have a sense of living life while you're open to having a pregnancy, to be able to manage it, to know that, to be flexible enough to realize, you know, I know myself, so I'm dialoguing with my team. And I'm not afraid of them. Or it's not it's not the uh, patriarchal system anymore. And that I can speak up and I can ask and I can have input and I need to have input and I need, might need support. I might need somebody with me to either take notes, clarify, throw in a question or calm things down, slow things down. All of that kind of. Um, so I believe it makes it more interesting and vibrant. Rather than saying, you know, you're a patient, you have a condition. So you're very apologetically going in and hoping something will be done for me. It's like, no, you're walking in there with, you know, the, the keys and the coffee. And it's like, what are you going to do for me? You're interviewing clinics. And not all fertility clinics are created equal by any stretch of anyone's imagination. We do not have a regulatory authority yet. So clinics are all private commercial enterprises. So it's very important to kind of match up and GPs sometimes, I mean, I have a lot of GPs on my books and they're always amazed at how little they know about actual fertility landscape in this country. And that always surprises me, you know. So that kind of guidance, that kind of um, very simply without having to add in another dimension of doing an MA in fertility or you know, having to be, you know, totally on top of everything and policing yourself. Um, you know, we we really need to ease it down that you can trust the people who are right for you. And that, you know, if it happens, it happens and you've done everything that you possibly can. So it's less about the guilt, the shame, the beating yourself up. Um, that's a huge element, you know, to a sense of compassion and forgiveness, which I know sound really old fashioned, but the idea of, you know, this life, if you're being philosophical, we have no entitlements. A lot of people feel they have. A lot of people look like they just snap their fingers and they get everything and, you know, life is easy. But if we look globally, as we can at this moment in time, most of the world lives in seriously challenging conditions. And, you know, I know it's very unfair at an individual level, but I guess if we can not feel guilty that we've done something wrong or we've committed a crime we didn't even know we had and we're being punished for it somehow, and those are the kind of things I like to kind of get across. Okay. And it's one of the things I think that I always say to people about being, you know, the CEO of your own healthcare and the CEO of your own sort of health team as well. And your fertility team does come into that. But equally, CEOs of big companies don't make decisions on their own. You know, they take advice from so many sources. And it's learning how to filter that advice as well. Um, we have, you know, and like I'm old enough to remember when we had way at one point not, we didn't have social media. And when social media and self-publishing came along, we had this explosion in misinformation, toxic information. Uh, we had this explosion in 
you know, dramatizing sort of everything that's come along. And that's not to say there's some brilliant sides to social media. Of course there is like, you know, we're in, you know, we've, we've got some great advocates out there and great um, people out there sharing their experiences, but it's learning to filter and learning to allow yourself that disconnect, I think as well, it's very important. And, you know, certainly from, and I don't have the fertility experience, but I certainly know from the pain experience side, that sometimes you go into that hyper focus on the pain or the negativity or the spiral that oh this is never going to stop this isn't going anywhere and from speaking to people over the years they that's that same spiral with fertility this is never gonna this is never gonna happen this is never gonna get better this is never going to work and you know there's not enough I think recognition that the mental emotional side as well as the physical side you know, needs to be addressed. And I think that's, you know, we see all the glossy ads for the clinics and that's great. And I do look forward to the day that we have very strict regulation um, in this country for lots of different reasons. I've got a, I've got a list, I think probably as long as yours. But um, I think too that no one, you know, if, if people are empowered to know the questions going in and they're empowered to know that their their cycle well enough, their situation well enough, and it's it's very similar to choosing a surgeon for your endometriosis surgery. There's no gold standard um, for endometriosis surgery. There's no gold standard for endometriosis surgeons. Those definitions don't exist yet. But what we do know is that people who you had excision or people who go to surgeons who exclusively operate on those with endometriosis have the best outcomes. And eventually the literature will catch up and all of that will come around and it will eventually make the guidelines. But for now, we're sort of looking at people are having to do a lot of their own research and a lot of their own investigation as well too. And I find that sort of the same with, with fertility as well. Like people are certainly chatting to me and they're saying, well, do I go to somebody here in Ireland? Do I go abroad? Do I go somewhere else? Do I give up completely? Do I try for another year? And I think the government's introduction last year of the um, limited IBS um, availability for, for couples as well, you know, while it was quite restricted and, you know, quite flawed in a lot of places, do you think that this is going to have any benefit in Ireland? Absolutely. Um, it's a start, um, a shaky, rocky start. Um, I think the really sad thing is that they haven't looked at restorative medical fertility care, which is well developed. In fact, some stunning research lately on DHEA treatment for recurrent miscarriage, supporting pregnancies. Um, you know, they have fertility hubs. They're not standardized. You are, they're as good as the personnel in them. And again, as you just put your finger on it so perfectly as you always do, um, the idea that people who are working with the same type of things day in and day out recognize patterns. They develop expertise over years, decades of doing this. And I would like to see standardized training from recognized um, centers of excellence uh, that will spread around. I'm sure it can happen. It could happen. But it's such a cliquey system. Um, they'll be very, very resistant to change. And that is such a shame because even if you're going for um, ART, for assisted reproductive me methods, which, um, you know, IVF, ICSI, those, you need to be in really good condition. And, you know, I think the, the crucial difference is that an IVF clinic, it's a bit like having a hammer. If you've got a hammer, you're going to look for a nail. IVF clinics will do IVF beautifully and wonderfully. They're not doing the investigation, not treating anything. IVF does not treat any condition whatsoever. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't improve the situation. It, it, it's another slight way. It, it's like a, a detour for an egg and sperm. It just makes that a little bit easier. They are improving there as well. And there are good people in operation there. But I would love to see the sense of project management as you said there earlier. So you present, and if, if it is a couple, if it is a heterosexual couple, it's like, okay, what have we got here? What have we got here? What can we improve here? And that you're layering it up in a logical, cost-effective, simple way with the absolute idea being to enhance 
the possibility of not just a positive pregnancy test, but a healthy pregnancy that leads to a healthy child. And not just the stats of how many pregnancies did we achieve, it's how many live births, how many healthy children. And the other thing about this approach that I love, because, you know, people do the bargaining, if I just have a child, I'll be grateful. And of course, yes, yes, of course you are. And it's lovely. But, you know, generally speaking, it is permissible. And before the pill was invented, women went into relationships not knowing how many pregnancies they'd have, 14, 15, 60, how many children they'd have, how many miscarriages they would have, how many stillbirths they'd have, how many neonatal deaths they'd have. My own grandmother lost her first two toddlers to scarlet fever and went on to have five more children. And, you know, it's not that terribly long ago, really. Um, and, the you know, now the I like to see that, yes, you're grateful for your child, but you might look at this gorgeous little bundle who's roaring at you like, we'd love another one. And that that is permissible and that enough has been done that then you might just slip into another pregnancy. That gives me the greatest joy of all, getting a message. I mean, you're not going to believe it. I didn't realise I'd missed a period. I'm now six weeks pregnant. And do you remember what it was like? And it's kind of like, oh my God, I do know what you went through. So, you know, I, I do think that uh, people jump, and this time of year, jumping straight to IVF and then retrospectively the sense of, oh my goodness me, or actually jumping into something like donor gamete, donor egg particularly. And then their child, beautiful child, beautiful child, slightly more complicated pregnancy, just a little extra minding is, is a good idea there. But conceiving a child naturally. And then, you know, they're thinking, what have I done? What does it mean? Um, because, you know, with donor egg, you have the identity issue and, you know, how you address that. And, you know, people are so, the amount of thought that goes into it, nobody undertakes any of these things lightly or flippantly. You know, there's a lot of soul searching. So helping, helping with those, and giving people the space in which to, you know, non-emotionally be able to discuss with a partner or, you know, people are often wondering, well, we can tell mammy and daddy. They'd have a heart attack if we were going to the States for surrogacy. We can tell them it's, you know, donor gametes, donor sperm, donor egg or whatever. And how do we, you know, we want to be honest with our child, but we don't want our child kind of tripping into grandma and granddad saying, hey, guess what? Because, you know, um, all of those kind of things can be very worrying and add to the burden. So having a space in which to discuss it and, you know, a little bit of planning and a bit of ease and making it less miserably, you know, secretive. It's it's very burdensome to carry a secret. It's very isolating. You feel like you're withholding from people and you're not being your honest, authentic self. So those kind of areas, I think, sound like they're the softer sides, but often when they're eased, somebody can have a clarity and they'll often describe it to me like a weight off. It's not as peculiar or strange or awful. Now I can see now we have, we'll have our time to talk. It's not the filter through which we view everything. And we are now moving into whatever we are going to. And moving as well, very, very importantly, pregnancy can happen. It may not happen. A child can be born. A child can be born too early. You know, there's children, very, very sick babies are born. I worked in special care baby in at NICU. And you can have babies born who are wonderful and gorgeous and miraculous. And they are so vulnerable and they do die. You know, not every child survives. You know, somebody can live to the age of 105 or 10 now. They can live to 80 or 50 or 40 or, you know, every single age we are death is very close to us and you know life is precious and fleeting and i think being able to understand that it's not been good or bad 
it's just as humans, as mammals, this is the way we are on this planet. And that, you know, not having a child, learning to live and live well, and to remember you're already living without a child right now. And deciding sometimes actually, and I, you know, people are very surprised. I've been really shocked, Kathleen. It's like, actually, do you know something? It felt like a massive weight off when we decided, do you know what? It's not going to happen for us. We will grieve and we will live and we will live well. And they do. And for my generation, I mean, I can count on my hand. I have six friends who didn't have children. And very sadly, there is another layer of not having grandchildren, which, you know, it, it's a loss that keeps on. It's not a loss that ever fades because all the markers, all the milestones, you know, you see people having their children's 18th birthday parties, celebrating, you know, the anniversaries or family Christmases, all of the things. But it's finding ways of living well and having a meaningful life that is doable. It seems insurmountable initially, but really realizing that life is what you make it and the ways that you can be. I send cards to my friends, um, to women friends. I always send them Mother's Day cards because they mother me. They mother everyone around them. Women mother each other. You know, the support systems and to realize that I hate the hallmark exclusivity. You know, well, I'm a mother. Kids are currency. Well, I'm a mother of, you know, six. It used to be six. Now it's kind of like three or two. And it's like, you know, I just have it made because I'm so special. And it's like, yes, it's wonderful. And I know you're very blessed, actually. I'm not lesser because I don't. And I can know about child care and about child rearing and all of that. I have a voice and I shouldn't be the one in the office or the school or the hospital who's doing Christmas or doing New Year. Ah, well, you don't have kids. I think that's really unfair. You know, the sense of having uh, an extra burden. So those are some of my thoughts on that. I'm rambling at this stage, I guess. You're not not rambling at all. And you're just, you've, you've just sort of, you know, uh, smoothed nicely into the sort of that, that next sort of topic I wanted to cover was around that loss because for all the beautiful we six week scans that we will get in the messages and you know those the wee baby pictures that we get like I have loads of um, endo nieces and nephews out there there is a lot of loss there's a lot of pain there's a lot of suffering there is a lot of trauma that goes with that as well too and the loss can be at any stage and um, and it can be at that pre-stage as well. And I think it is very important to acknowledge that that sort of mother role. We all have that mother role in us no matter what. And and I think that's so, so important. And I, I love that idea. I really do like that idea that, you know, celebrating it on Mother's Day no matter what, I think is is very good and very important, you know. Um, I think we're starting to see this generation coming up now where they're choosing not to have children. And we're starting to see those conversations coming out in the open a bit more. And likewise, I think with the adenomyosis and endometriosis side, that those conversations are happening. Um, and you'd like to think that, you know, the two people are going to be sitting 20 years time having this conversation. Um, it'll be different. It'll be easier. We won't have this sort of societal judging at, at work, like the whispering behind your back, wondering when you're going to have that child or wonder which side is the fault on or what the problem is or how much should they pay to that clinic now in such a country and you know, we, we've become a nation of gossips too at the same time. And I certainly know my own experience and the experience of a lot of people who travel even for surgery, letting alone for children's treatment. You're seen as having notions on yourself altogether. You know, what's wrong with this country or what's wrong with this doctor or what's wrong with this hospital? Um, and instead of seeking out that sort of best care or what's appropriate for you. And unfortunately for some patients, the appropriate care is you know, to remove the reproductive organs, if they're non-functioning, if the uterus has an anomyosis, if it has fibroids, if it has Asherman syndrome, because we are a big fan of DNCs in this country, we have a lot of women end up with damage to the uterus as well. So there's there's lots of things, but I'm, I'm looking forward to see where this generation coming up are going to take it, because I think they're a lot more open. They're a lot more open in their conversations. Um, 
So it'll be very interesting to see how that sort of pans out. But in terms of dealing with that loss and, you know, in dealing with, I suppose, the lost opportunities, the physical loss, the mental, emotional loss, um, and, you know, you've, you've appeared on a documentary, you know, to discuss this as well too. And, you know, can you take me through just very gently how you would deal with that? Are there tools that you can give to people or is it just something that you have to suffer through and come out the other side, you know, or can we learn tools that will help us with this? I guess it's very easy to do premature grieving. And that's something that happens when somebody is diagnosed with cancer. And I've sat on beds. You weren't allowed to sit on beds back in the day as a nurse, but four o'clock in the morning. And somebody's saying the worst thing about their diagnosis of cancer, terminal cancer, was, say, for instance, the brother-in-law coming in at visiting time who would normally be telling dirty jokes, smutty jokes, and he was being real nice. And you're different. And that hurt most of all to be treated differently. You know, I think don't show your baby the not telling of news, the opening up Facebook and it's another stabbing of a balloon and a gender reveal. You know, being othered is unbelievably hurtful. And as humans, as mammals, and we're very closely related to baboons, it's the same thing in their society, the alpha females wants to preclude the others from breeding and they bully them unmercifully because they only have to look for food for about three hours in a day. That's a lot of daylight on the savannah, you know, kind of what we, we do a bit of grooming and then we do a bit of battering and all that kind of thing. Uh, Robert Sapolsky uh, writes about this very well. He's a Stanford behaviorist. He's a neuroscientist. And the sense of, you know, the, the premature grieving, um, is tempting because we feel if I go grieving now, it won't be as bad if I have a miscarriage or it doesn't happen for me. It's a bit like appeasing the gods. I'm not getting notions. I'm aware and I'm kind of doing it now. And there is nothing you can really do to buffer it because by grieving prematurely, you're detracting from the, your power in this moment of getting stuff done, of living. You're not diluting the actual grief you're going to feel. You're only prolonging it. So in the sense of, I guess I use hypnosis, hypnotherapy, because it's quick. I learned, I was trained in it as a, a student midwife. And we had more people use the midwives. This was down in Plymouth. The West Country accent was amazing. It was really good. Um, we had more people delivering naturally with just midwife care because we were independent practitioners in our own right, although we're part of the hospital, in the hospitals, you know. And this was before epidurals were available in this country. It took a long time to get, you know, the sense of women suffering and in suffering shall you bring forth type of thing. Um, and that's why I did not do midwifery in this country. That's why I've never practiced as a midwife in this country. I find the attitudes were astonishing. And the sense of, you know, to allow somebody to know that their grief is valid, the grief of loss, the grief of loss of your femininity, loss of yourself, your identity, your identity within a relationship, within a family. Say, for instance, particularly as the eldest of a family, the first to do the leaving, the first to go to college, the first to get a job, the first to get married. No child. The youngest people coming up and it's suddenly like, but I was the first to do everything. And I brought you all up. Um, so that sense of the tools and techniques I would employ is a very rapid trauma intervention using EMDR to get the processing of the grief. It's not getting rid of the memory or the sense of, you know, that's in the past. It's integrating this. This is who I am now. I'm somebody who's had these losses. They are part of me and who I am. They shape me. I'm not denying it in any way. I'm proud of who I am. It's about keeping relationships. It's about keeping meaning, finding more meaning, keeping meaning, um, nurturing yourself emotionally as well as physically and not feeling lesser and not allowing people to that semi-subconscious bullying that actually goes on. 
Uh, you notice a lot in staff rooms, actually. Some staff rooms are great, but sometimes they can be very challenging places to operate in. You know, as you said, like, oh, you're married two years now. And it's like, you know, mm, what's happening? And the sense of, oh, my God, we're exhausted. You know, I'm pregnant for the fifth time and, you know, we're getting the kind of, you know, giant car or whatever it is, which is lovely, but it can be a bit of triumphalism. So it's also, I help people, one of the major tools I do is slightly zoonotic. It's helping someone to develop the hide of a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a life skill in itself. Oh, yeah. For everything. You know, the sense of not taking it to heart and not responding that way. Uh, it's, you know, about being able to, you know, like a politician on, on the, the plinth, having sound bites, stuff not getting into you, because otherwise it's death by a thousand cups and you do not need that. So I work with, you know, EMDR, which is integrating trauma, releasing it very, very quickly and really quite gently. So it's not deep, dark Freudian, you know, therapy around in circles. It's as conversational as we are now. And then it's um, using hypnotherapy, which is focusing attention. And then it is, you know, allowing mental rehearsals of living in certain ways or managing certain situations. It's explorations. And most people find, oh, I never thought of things like that. Or, well, that seems actually quite interesting or doable. It's about the lifestyle factors of improving the quality of sleep, making better decisions, enjoying better quality food, not being as hungry for shite as easily, uh, you know, doing different things, meeting different people. Um, so it's about allowing people to engage. Those are kind of the tools and the techniques. Uh, being fully alive is actually how that's a lot of feedback I'll get. And it's like, well, it's like I kind of actually woke up. So that sounds very vague. So I'm not prescriptive with here's your homework and you have to do this, that or the other. I do train people to use self-hypnosis. So if they are, for instance, having a root canal, they need less anesthetic. If they're having a Brazilian, they can chat away merrily. And, you know, if they do go on to become pregnant, it is easier to engage. And, you know, you can still use um, pain meds. Uh, pethidine is not good for childbirth. Just as an aside, it's great for renal pain. Amazing. And drug addicts love it. But the um, for actual delivery, it makes people woozy and vomity and out of control. And it doesn't touch the pain. So that's just a little caveat to bear in mind for anybody you know. Um, but the tools and techniques um, would be, you know, associating with people and a diff different ages of people, different groups, interesting people, not sticking, you know, like the people you've come up with through school and college who are doing all the same things. You may not fit in at that moment. Find other people. Um, you know, everything, whether it is deciding, okay, my little bit of garden outside, I'm actually going to grow spuds. I'm going to do something. I'm going to take up something. I'm going to explore something. I'm going to read something. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to do something completely different. Um, that you're alive to living. Or the other thing is, you know, somebody recently was telling me that, you know, she was having a very, very difficult time and very bleak news. And we discussed, you know, the sort of Mediterranean situation. And obviously I feel very passionate about that because I'm a midwife. I'm a, you know, life living, protecting, you know, anyway, she has become very involved in amnesty and said you know i have the time i she's very 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 articulate and helping other people you know that it's by each other we live anyway and we are connected so the risk of isolation is huge and mammals humans primates do not do well in isolation so it's very easy to say head down and i'll keep going so i'm about connecting in useful beneficial ways that work. So self-hypnosis skills, dealing with trauma, reconnecting, minding the relationship because your relationship is prime. It's why you're 
you know, together and to realize that fertility issues, even though it may seem that because of these conditions, it's one-sided, sometimes it is very much a shared issue as well. And, you know, having seen people with varying degrees of endo who have moved from one relationship to another and then out of a clear blue sky conceived and had children, it's kind of like, oh, didn't know that. So, you know, strange things can happen and that is lovely. That is not the norm, um, but there are possibilities. So I guess... Um, the pressure to conceive in a pronatalist society is massive and women do take on the burden for guys' loss and grief and broodiness. I was actually talking to um, Rob Hadley the other night. He's got a fantastic book, How Can a Man Be a Man? And he's a PhD who has not had children and has written about it in a really warm way. I was dreading his book because I, I never managed to read it, but I was up till two in the morning reading it. And he, you know, the sense of he's interviewed a lot of people for his thesis and their perspective and their perspective of what their partner was going through and the lack of understanding. So communication in a relationship is massive. And it, it's a gift if you can get that together as well, you know. Yeah. And they're all tools that stand to us no matter what, aren't they? Recognizing that interconnectedness. Like as a species, we're interconnected as everything on the planet. We're all interconnected. There's a part of us and everything and everybody. Um, and I think recognizing that's so important, you know, and using those positive relationships, using those positive communication tools, using the skills, and techniques that we pick up along the way. I'm always banging on with the 1% theory. Whatever that 1% is for you, go for it because if it makes a difference it's a huge thing you know and knowing then again to let go of maybe some of the toxic things as well too let go of some of the negative things that maybe we do hold on to I think is always important and maybe that is eating the bag of crisps every night or maybe it is a wee bit of the negative self-talk as well too you know there's there's so so much can be done and you know I know sometimes that when you know dealing with topics such as you know, fertility and infertility, you know, um, miscarriage, loss, endometriosis, all of those things, they're incredibly heavy. They're incredibly draining. And at the same time, we have certainly met some of the most amazing people within this community. And I've made lifelong friends as a result. And, you know, that's something that that's always to be kept in mind that we're not really defined by the label of pain or fertility or endometriosis or infertility or one child or no child you know we're none of those labels like well that's sort of way um we might be a lot of things all together you know and I think that's it can be can lose sight of that sometimes can't you absolutely um and I it's one thing I've always hated is to be labeled um you know I remember finding it really strange when I went to train as a midwife and it's like the Irish midwife and you know, everything, if I did something or said something, it was because I was Irish. And I remember being really indignant about that. And it really made me think about finding out, well, who is this person and what are they about? And, you know, again, I have found, and you've been, you know, so very inclusive and so gently helpful to improving my understanding of endometriosis, adenomyosis, what it means, what life is like, what's happening. And, you know, um, Shannon Cohen's incredible documentary, which um, Darren Barrett is now showing down in uh, Tralee. I'm, I'm going to be heading down there. Um, that, you know, to see other people's stories, not to feel as alone and isolated and peculiar and strange and shamed. That, you know, the opening up and, you know, um, very sadly, Dr. Redwine dying recently. And, you know, the, the wonderful work that um, is done, you know, is being continued, his wonderful work being continued and, and opening up. And even now we're looking at something very interesting coming up. I'm not sure if you're involved in, on the 2nd or 3rd of March in the RDS, the Future Fertility Show. And if you haven't been approached, I certainly have mentioned your name a time or 10, um, because 
they're bringing together people so very well from all the different areas and they're very genuinely interested in giving proper information laying it out it's it's uh the, the i was really impressed actually because obviously i was kind of thinking it's a light to the future beauty thing so like hello um but no so with the sense of having these where people can access talk discuss and that the professionals themselves who are so siloed so defensive and you know insular uh the thing that actually meet there was the, the press uh, launch was on at the end in the middle of October and my daughter and granddaughter came along and, you know, we were, we were talking about endometriosis and um, the idea that people can break down barriers, discuss, share, talk, develop trust. And this is all for everyone's betterment, you know, and that's really what it's all about. That's what you've been doing for such a long time and doing it so incredibly well and for that i really am very very grateful you know thank you well we'll definitely put a link to the um the fertility show in the show notes as well too and helena we could chat definitely for another hour i'm gonna wrap this up and i'm just going to to um can you tell people how we can find you how we can get in touch and how we can sort of you know make sure that people can connect with your services as well so What's the best way to say? I'm probably most active on Instagram as Helena Tubridy and my website is helenatubridy.com. So I know you'll also find me on LinkedIn, but uh, Instagram is the one. So yeah, that thank you so much, Kelsey. No problem. Well, I'll pop a link in here as well. Like, you know, that's right. And Helena, it's been a pleasure as always talking to you. I always learn so much and your voice just has that ability to downregulate any stress or any tension that's in my body. So you're my, you're my natural sort of pain reliever as well too, which is fantastic. Like, you know, <laughs> but I do, I always learn so much and it's, it's been fantastic. So um, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for listening to this episode of Darg and we'll catch up with you again soon. 